Test. Uh, under agenda changes, under public participation, although I do not see him, uh, Reverend Derek Shelby is added. Uh, under the Chairman's report, we're going to have a, just a quick uh, bullet point update on the 1% public safety tax uh, budget update. Uh, and with that, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Wilson? Present. Viando? Present. Booker? Present. Boomer? Here. Crosby? Here. Fellers? Here. Fiducia? Here. Girl? Present. Coral? Present. Hoffman? Present. Jury? Present. Kelly? Here. McDonald? Present. Nicolosi? Here. Red? Present. Salgado? Present. Schultz? Here. Tassoni? Present. Webster? Here. Westcott? Present. Pony, Pony present, no absent. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, well, good evening again, and uh, with that, we'll have everybody stand for the invocation. I'll turn things over to Mr. Booker. Thank you, Chair. Dear Father in Heaven, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the many blessings that we've received this day. Dear Father, we thank you for our gathering, and we ask for your continued blessings that help guide us to make the decisions that best affect our citizens that we serve. Father, we ask for your guardianship of our police and fire and EMTs, and your guardianship of our men and women that serve here and abroad, that you bring them home safely to their families. Father, we also ask for your comfort for Kevin Reardon, our friend Kevin Reardon, who uh, lost his father recently. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Booker. No awards this evening. Uh, we'll move on to presentations. Uh, we have uh, two 10-minute uh, presentations, 10, 12-minute uh, presentations tonight. Um, and uh, the first one is on the Fusion Center. And uh, with that, I would invite up uh, Sheriff uh, Caruana and uh, our Rockford Police Chief, Dan O'Shea. Uh, thank you both uh, for being here, gentlemen. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're going to do the presentation, the PowerPoint. Um, Dan and I have been talking about uh, the Fusion Center that they have, and I, I saw one in New York. I have not been to the Chicago one or the Elgin one, I guess, was a bus trip plan. But as we drill down, it just makes sense to do a regional approach to how we're doing the law enforcement. You know, we're teaming up real strongly with our narcotics teams, our scope and scope attack units, our domestic violence. Um, we're working on combining our SWAT team. So there's a lot of things that we're working on together to combat our regional problem. We're both committed to the regional approach. And I started looking at this, we started talking, and it's like, let's start inner city, but build it and get on board early on and have a more of a um, regional approach as we build this. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan and let him go through the fine map points of the Fusion Center. Thanks, Sheriff. Uh, good evening. Thanks. I won't take much of your time, but I do appreciate a couple minutes speaking in front of you. Um, the city council doesn't like hearing from me anymore. I'm just kidding. Uh, but I appreciate your time. At any rate, uh, basically you can read it. I'm not going to read it to you. We'll, I will send you the PowerPoint afterwards so you can look through it and take your time and go through it later. I don't print out copies. We're trying to save trees all that stuff. So, um, Rockford Regional Crime Information Analysis Center. Um, basically what it is is a fusion center. The, the description of a fusion center according to the Congressional Research Services on there is the bottom paragraph. Basically the, our goal with a fusion center and intelligence and, and uh, analysis center 
in Rockford City is a regional approach. Most of the crime right now occurs in the city of Rockford. We know that violent crime continues to stay even or go up. We know that the rest of our crime continues to go down. The problem with it is it's not just in the city of Rockford. It's going to go into Winnebago County. It goes into Boone County. It goes into Stevenson County. It's a region, and Gary and I talk about this daily. Uh, if not two or three times a day. We're trying to attack things on a regional mindset. Uh, and some of the things we're gonna do is deploy technology. Technology is a force multiplier in any, uh, in any event or any venue, if you will. And force multipliers we're talking about using um, would include gunshot detection systems, video surveillance systems, um, the automated license plate readers, and then a thing called a PSIM, which we use computer savvy. It's basically it's middleware that it's pretty expensive middleware, I'll tell you right now, but what it does is it takes video systems from the city, from the county, from private entities. It takes all sorts of computer uh, components from all different entities and it makes it into one usable format. So it's kind of a funnel of technology. Uh, expensive technology, but again, when you look at how uh, technology is expensive up front, but the maintenance doesn't include legacy costs and, and pension costs and that kind of stuff down the road and it's kind of a force multiplier. So basically I'll send you this uh, a little while what the Fusion Center is. It just streams in information and intelligence including that data flowing from federal government, state, local, uh, tribal, and we don't have a tribe here, but all the other entities as well as private sectors that um, come into the Fusion Center and it's the information we'll use. Definitions of what data fusion is according to the federal government. Uh, New York PD has the ultimate fusion center. They have the Taj Mahal because they are the number one terrorist target attack venue in the, uh, the United States. Chicago PD has a thing called the CPIC, the Chicago Police Information Center. It's a smaller version of the fusion center from NYPD, but it is really high speed. Uh, they are currently expanding it greatly in Chicago because of the recent violent crime that they're having. They're adding another four police districts of gunshot detection systems, which equates out to about 40 something miles of gunshot detection system. Pretty expensive, but the CPD sees the, the, the value of it. They're currently doing that. Gunshot detection systems, if you don't know what they are, I'll talk about them real briefly. Uh, companies will come in and they install acoustics, small antennas, small boxes in a certain geographical area. The geographical areas that we've identified in the city limits, uh, initially I asked for three square miles on the west side and three square miles on the east side. It's not square, obviously, but three, uh, three square miles of coverage on both sides, where we uh, recently and, and traditionally have all of our gunfire. Uh, we have a lot of gunfire in the city. We had 161 people hit by gunfire last year, and obviously 27 homicides. So gunfire, gunshot detection systems, wherever the company is, they install acoustics, somebody fires a gun, the acoustics triangulate to within 20 meters of where that person is when they fire the gun, right when they fire the gun. So companies, uh, that monitor it, they come out, they install acoustics, then they monitor it, they hear gunfire, it sends an instant alert to them as well as the mobile data terminals and the officers' cars. It pops up, it shows them real-time information on a Google Maps or a Yahoo map or whatever, uh, right where the gunfire came from. And it's almost instantaneous, it's within 30 seconds. So we're not waiting for people to call the police. A lot of times people don't call the police anymore. They've grown used to gunfire, they don't think we're coming. Uh, they don't want to be the person reporting it, so people don't report gunfire. Well, if, if we do, and what do we do with these gunshot detection systems? And we anticipate our gunshot reporting rate to go up 75 to 80 percent. That is what it's gone up in areas that have deployed gunshot detection systems, which means about 20 percent of the time we're actually getting called about shots fired, and that's that's not good. And that's a national average. I have seen the system take play our work. Uh, I was in South Bend, Indiana. They have it. Employed there, deployed there. It's very, uh, very active in South Bend, and it's very accurate according to the officers. They usually get gunshot detection alerts. They show up on the scene, and it's right there within five feet of where the gunfire was detected and reported by these uh, systems. That helps the officers respond to the scene, keeps them safe. They don't drive through the gunfire scene going to a house when the gunfire was over here. When people hear gunfire, they say, "Ah, oh, it's out behind my house." They don't know exactly where it is unless they see it. So officers respond knowing where the gunfire came from versus where someone called from 123 Main Street said I heard gunfire in the area. The officers drive around for 10 minutes driving up and down streets. Sometimes they find the casings, sometimes they don't find the casings, sometimes they find a victim, but maybe it might be 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes later. 
that's not uh, that's not good policing. That's not safe policing, and it's not what's best for the city and the county. That's gunshot detection. I'll, I'll touch on that real quick. Or I touched on it real quick. That's one component of a fusion center. Another component is public video surveillance. Everybody knows about video surveillance cameras. You see them on light poles. You see them on traffic signals. You see them all over the place. You've seen what they can do. The picture on the left shows you an overall of a city street. The picture on the right is something of a pan tilt zoom camera. So uh, pan tilt zoom cameras allow us to spin them around and actually zoom in on things at different distances. Camera systems deployed with in concert with a gunshot detection system in a fusion center. We get gunshots here at 123 Main Street, instantaneously find out there's gunfire there. Either the cameras can be automated to turn toward the gunfire at those prospective intersections, or the people in the Fusion Center can start turning the cameras that way so we can catch vehicles or people coming out of that area. And you need to be able to do it quickly. There are systems that allow them to work together and sync together, and then there's also the manpower one where there's people in the Fusion Center who can turn the cameras. But it allows us to capture either people, cars, uh, victims, suspects coming and going from the area so we can nail down and investigate it quickly. Next part of it, automated license plate readers. The city currently has two systems going on, mobile cars, the middle picture there. Four cameras go on top of the cars and they read license plates automatically all day long. They can build, I mean they can bring in about a thousand plates a day. The officers never have to type a computer, they never have to radio in for a license plate. These things read them, they scan them, it's all automated, and if they get a wanted car, a stolen car, a car that's wanted for a homicide, it pops up automatically in the officer's car on their computer instantaneously. It says, boom, that car is wanted. It was taken off the right front camera. Look for that car. There's a picture of the car on their computer, and they can look and see where the car is at, and they can grab it real quick. It helps officers. It's very, very, very efficient. We're going to be putting those on cars uh, in two weeks on the city. Gary and I talk. We'll be putting some on the county cars, and then we're also going to put them in choke points throughout the city, probably the bridges, people crossing east to west so we can obtain data. Um, and it, GPS locates them, it's a fantastic system uh, that's coming as well. And then the biggest component of the fusion center is something called the PSIM, and it's a lot of, uh, it's very difficult to explain, that's why there's a lot of words there. I'm not a computer guy, I wish I was, because I probably wouldn't be a chief of police, I'd be making money somewhere. Um, kidding. Um, but the, uh, come on, laugh, you got yeah, they have fun at these meetings. Um, the PSIM basically is the, the brains of the outfit. It takes all this technology and it brings it together. And it makes it easy for the end user sitting in front of it at the, uh, at the Fusion Center. Uh, it provides great situational awareness for the officers real time. And also provides great management reporting for us on the backside as well as investigative capabilities. It helps us solve crimes quicker. It helps us get these violent criminals off the street quicker. Uh, it's uh, it's the end-all deal of a brain for us. It's referred to as middleware, if you will. It's not software, it's not hardware, but it takes everybody's systems. The biggest benefit of this, and a lot of people don't know this, if you have a house camera, or a BP Amico, or a gas station, or a Meyer, they all have cameras. If businesses in, and residents will allow us access to their systems, we don't monitor their systems, and it's obviously only external systems, not in someone's house. Um, but if they have, if they say, okay, yeah, you can mark my my house with cameras, we put it into a keep building a database of a big map of the whole region. An incident happens at one two three Main Street, real time. They can pick up a map, pull it up, blow it up, and they go, okay, there's a camera here, camera here, camera here, camera here. The detectives and the officers can recover video from those respective places within a half hour instead of within two days. Uh, if they are external cameras and they're big corporations, the officers can sometimes log into their IP address that the, the company gives us, and we can start monitoring their cameras right away. Part of that might be the public school system down the road, you know, that's all legal stuff, but if we have an active shooter inside of a high school and we have the authority to go into those cameras, the officers don't have to run into harm's way. We can sit there in the real-time information center or the confusion center, and they can say, okay, it looks like he's in the gym right now, according to the cameras, and it's it's a huge officer safety benefit uh, on the streets or in companies. But the PSIM is the is the brains behind that. I will tell you that a PSIM a ballpark sometimes they're a half million dollars, three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, all the technology I'm talking about, intersection cameras, pan tilt zoom cameras are five thousand dollars a piece. The license plate readers for a four camera system is twenty thousand dollars. Again, I know this stuff is expensive, and it's uh, part of my part of my plea to the council, and I applaud the city council for approving a million dollars about a month and a half ago, and I'm 
trying to get everybody in the entire region on board. Gary and I are very much on board building this into a regional center. Next week, um, we have a bus trip available if you guys want to go. I thought the email made it to you all last week. I just talked to three county board members who said they didn't hear about it. I will make sure the email comes back to you for sure tomorrow to all of you. Uh, we'll get a bus, we'll get a coach bus or whatever. We'll take you all down to the Chicago Police uh, Fusion Center as well as the Cook County Homeland Security Fusion Center. It'll be an all-day trip, I'll tell you that. We'll leave in the morning, head to Oak Forest for the Cook County one, head to Chicago, look at theirs, and then you can stop at Elgin on the way out. They have a camera system there. Uh, so you can see like a really nice fusion center, Cook, or Cook in Chicago, and you can see the bottom end of it, or the lower, uh, low cost end with Elgin. And we're looking at building something in between out here in Rockford and the region. I will get that to you if you want to go on the bus trip. And questions, if you want any real quick, we can do them, or you can email me, talk to me later, talk to the sheriff. We'll be available for any questions. Blowing through as fast as I can, sorry about that. We have a, I think we have a time for a couple quick questions. Um, one thing I would say is we're not making, just so we're clear, this isn't, the board's not being asked to do anything or consider anything formally tonight. Mr. Mr. O'Shea, when is the bus trip again? Bus trip is Wednesday the 19th. Um, I have Mr. Nicolosi, then Mr. Booker, and then we're going to have to move on, I believe, to our next guest, Mr. Nicolosi. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll just make it quick. Um, you, you said that these can tie into existing, can they tie into like security cameras that are on IP? So if I had like, my business, an ADT kind of situation with permission, that could be all linked up and that could be a camera then, so it would be a low cost for a, for a business owner or homeowner? There would be no cost to the, the person, who, the end user who's, who has the current system. They just expect to give us the access to it. That's the, the PSIM takes that in. It could be at t it could be you know Verizon, it could be any, and it takes all these different enterprise systems and it's the funnel and it brings them all together. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nicolosi, Mr. Booker. Thank you, Chairman. How does the gunfire, uh, Chief, how does the gunfire detection system differentiate between gunfire and fireworks or backfire of a Red Westcott pickup truck? There's different, there's different decibel levels for a lot of things. Uh, there's, there's sensors out there that can detect spray cans now. They know the, the decibel level of an aerosol spray can. Um, and it's not 100% foolproof, but as soon as the alarm goes off, the company that monitors it in California or wherever they're based out of, they instantly listen to it. They have people there 24-7. They listen to it. They count the number of gun, gunshots. They know it's gunshots. They dispatch it to the police terminal within about 30 seconds. I've heard it, I've seen it, I can show a demo for you at a different time when you guys have more time and you can you can see it real time on a map. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Booker. Uh, Mr. Fiducia had a quick question, we'll, we'll include him. I, I do have a comment. And what I'm gonna ask my fellow board members, if you're available Wednesday the 19th, I think it's uh, really imperative that you take this trip and see this technology because this technology is the cutting edge and we need to be on top of that. And I also want to commend you two guys. Uh, you're doing some right things. It's really looking good and I'm, I, I, and I'm supporting you 100%. And, I'll, and like I said, i got 31 years. I'll donate myself to you, whatever you need, because I want to see this move forward. Gary, you're, you're right on on this one. Dan, you're right on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fenusha, and thank you, Sheriff and Chief O'Shea. Really appreciate it. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Before I bring up um, Senator Severson for a legislative update, two, two quick things. We're going to start maybe every quarter bringing up a different member of the state delegation for a legislative update. That way, in the course of the year, we get to all of our representatives locally on both sides of the aisle. And then one quick introduction, we should acknowledge our new mayor-elect uh, in the city of Loves Park. Uh, our new mayor, uh, Mayor Jury, is here, and uh, we should uh, give him a round of applause for this nice week. And with that, I want to bring up uh, Senator Severson uh, to give us a legislative update out of Springfield. And uh, interesting times here and uh, down there as well. So thank you for being here, Senator. Thank you. It's uh, always great to be back here and uh, give you a little update of what's not going on in Springfield. Uh, but uh, first, uh, thanks for what you do. Uh, you guys have really uh, you set the you set the tone of how to work in a bipartisan way to get things done. And uh, as a county, you guys uh, really have been tackling some uh, big things, that, uh, and so we appreciate that. 
when I open up the paper in the morning, if you know Gary Jury's in it, not me, it's a good day. So, <laughs> so that's uh, most important. So, but um, so I thought what I want to do is just give you uh, uh, what's going on, and 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 it's not necessarily as bad as what it, it sounds because the issues that we're facing in, in Springfield, while they're they're big issues, they're not insurmountable issues. Uh, and uh, as you know, for the last two years, we've not had a we've not had a budget. Uh, but it, and that's really caused by you know a couple of different issues. You have one side, you've got the, the speaker that wanted uh, taxes raised and not really any, any systemic changes in government, and then the other side you had the governor wanted you know to make some significant changes in uh, the way uh, Illinois delivers government, and so they uh, they both uh, had concerns and they introduced budgets that wouldn't work and so no budget ended up being ended up passing and so that's gone on for the last two years now a lot of government still operates uh, because much of the state government is is done by court orders it's done by consent decrees it's uh, mandated payments that we already have it's pension payments we have to do and so uh, that's why you don't see a lot of upheaval yet because uh, most of the core services are still operating the problem is that we are spending about $11 million a day more than, than we have revenue coming in. And so that's where it, it starts to back up as our unpaid bills continue to grow. And so that's why there's an urgency of trying to get this done. In the Senate, you probably heard some talk about the grand bargain. Since the House and the governor weren't getting along in the Senate, we're trying to work on a bipartisan uh, bill that is going to uh, address uh, a variety of core issues. It's not just about raising taxes, it's not just about cutting spending. There are some uh, changes that we have to make in Illinois to, for us to move forward. So the grand bargain is about 12 different bills and it includes things like procurement reforms, it has a local government mandate relief, it has the ease of consolidation of local governments uh, as part of it. Uh, there's a pension reform uh, as much as what the courts will allow us uh, this year. Uh, our pension payment in, is increasing from 9.4 to 10.4 billion dollars. A billion dollar increase in our pension payment. That's about a third of our uh, monies that come in that goes to pensions. And the pension liability is growing more than what the new revenue growth is every year. So, uh, we're, so we're looking at a again a bipartisan pension reform bill that uh, will hold up in court. The one that should be fair. Uh, so that's that's being looked at. Um, obviously, a gaming bill. Uh, the gaming bill has already passed the Senate. Uh, it, it'll be good for our area, but it's also good for Illinois. Uh, Chicago is a uh, Chicago has significant financial problems, and they've always relied on all of us in the past to pay them, uh, because you had the governor and the legislature all from Chicago, and so they've always received a lion's share of money. When the governor came in, there was a balance, and they said, we're not going to keep bailing out Chicago uh, as much as we've been doing. The gaming bill will help Chicago. They need a casino. Uh, it will help their tourism. It will help with their conventions. It will help keep people in Illinois. So it's, it's a big deal for Chicago uh, and for the rest of the state. $1.6 billion <coughs> left Illinois last year and went to just the five surrounding states uh, to gamble. $1.6 billion. And we have other states that are building casinos right on the Illinois border to try to attract Illinois residents. So that's not the answer to everything, but it does create construction jobs and it does keep money here, uh, here in Illinois. Uh, and so then we come to how do we deal with the, the uh, how do we deal with the budget issue? And this is where it becomes a problem and where we need legislators to act like adults. Uh, the problems that have been building for the last 12 years that we've warned about. There is not a painless solution to fixing the problem. And so when you get people on either side telling you that this thing can be fixed by either we can make enough cuts to make it work, or we just have to raise taxes and make it work, they're just not being honest. There, there isn't a painless solution. So just to give you a quick idea on the budget that we're trying to put together, uh, we've already made about 700 million in cuts. Uh, with the pension reform, we hope to save about another $1 billion a year. Then we're agreeing on another $500 million in cuts that both sides have agreed to come up with. Another $500 million in cuts. You do all of that, and we're still going to be about 
four and a half billion dollars short annually. Even with all those cuts, four and a half billion dollars short. So now, if we put the income tax back on, and uh, like it was before, back to 5%, and you put the corporate tax back on, you do that, uh, that'll take care of about uh, three and a half a billion of that. You put all those taxes back on, and you're still going to be short almost one billion dollars a year. After the cuts, after the tax increases, you're still a billion short. And next year, when the pension costs increase by one billion, then we're short another billion. So that's the size of the problem. And so it's, it's frustrating when we get people that say, just cut your way out of it, because you can't. The only things you could cut that much would be cutting education or cutting local government funding. Both of those are going to drive up property taxes. So in the end, we hope in the Senate we're going to come up with a bipartisan plan that includes tax increases and includes cuts and includes some job reforms. Uh, work comp reform has got to be part of that because we have to keep manufacturers here. Uh, but other issues, the governor has agreed to take off the table. So things like uh, a right to work, some of the prevailing wage issues, uh, term limits, those things the governor's agreed to compromise on as well. So um, we hope we can get that uh, those things done this year. And I would urge that uh, if uh, things come up, that you talk to your legislators and tell them to support a plan that is fair and balanced, and uh, which we think this one is going to be. So with that, I'd be happy to answer a couple of good questions. Uh, we're here. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to go Mr. Webster, Mr. Jury, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, yes, first of all, Senator, thank you for coming here tonight. I hope you come around a little more often. Um, you kind of opened the door for this. I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. Uh, you mentioned that even at your level there, you guys, the, the state has to pay certain things due to court orders or government uh, mandates and that. So I want to know, were you, what was your position on these mandates that we've been struggling with so much here lately that we frankly cannot afford? That's a great question. And how, I, how did you vote on that? I, I voted against, I voted against pretty much all the mandates. So it's, uh, the idea of Springfield telling every county one size fits all makes no sense. The county is closest to the people. If there's a need that's here, you know what it is, and you're going to address it. We don't have to tell you to address the need. You already know that. And so when we passed some of these different mandates, you know, we did the we did the bill that raised the juror pay and made you guys do it, and then we did a shackle of bills. And so we do these things because it it sounds good. And uh, I don't support those, but again, it ends up costing you money. And the idea of telling uh, Boone County and Cook County both have to do the same things, it, it makes no sense. So uh, as you hear about mandates being talked about, I would urge you to call your legislators and tell them it may sound good, but don't support it. If it's a need, we'll address it uh, locally. Because each one of those mandates end up costing you a lot of money and we don't give you money along with the mandates, so uh, we shouldn't be doing those. Yeah, and, and that's the big problem. You, you, you tell us to pay some, but we don't have money to do it. Uh, follow up to that there, do you know, are any mandates looming in the wings there that we should know about? Well, yeah, it's never, you're never safe when the Springfield's in session. Lots of bad bills, so I can give a list of bills, some of the crazy bills. So one of those they're trying to push through, by the way, is that, is, CASA for animals, so they want uh, court-appointed uh, attorneys for animals uh, before they can be put down or dealt with. So uh, they get all sorts of those. Most of those never pass, so don't worry about that. But when you hear about mandates, you need to really step up. We're also looking at part of a grand bargain about some of these mandate repealers. So if there are mandates that, that the county is having to implement that doesn't have a real cost analysis or basis that makes sense for it, you need to let us uh, let us know that and let's look at repealing some of those things that, because you, you may have a better way of delivering the service without that mandate. So if there are ideas, uh, get them to us or us, any legislators, and uh, let's see if we can help reduce some of those. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Webster, Mr. Jury. Uh, thank you, Chairman Haney. Uh, Dave, first of all, thanks for being here and, and your and your long-term service. Uh, you know, you look a little different from 1991 when we were sitting in uh, your office, the campaign office, right, right down Carter's. That's, that's a long time ago when we were all there. 
Thank you for bringing that up. But, uh, you know, we, under, we understand the, the state situation, and I think you understand ours. I mean, we're in the same boat as the state. So, uh, you know, I guess we can only tell you, please go back to Springfield. I know it won't do a whole hell of a lot of good, but we can't afford any more mandates. And as you know, what the crisis we're in with the judge right now and so on and so forth, we cannot find, we just can't finance it. We're at a point where we're literally broke. Now, but hands off to the county. When, you know, when you, when, in government, when you hear about people talking about cutting spending, you know, what they're talking about usually in government spending is cutting the amount of increase they're talking about. In your case, the county, you guys really do cut, and you have cut your spending. So uh, you have done well. Obviously, you have growing needs, because, of, uh, especially because of law enforcement issues. But uh, you guys have managed your budgets. and. Uh, where the state has not uh, done as what they should have. So, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jury. I have Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Biondo, and then I know I need to get Mr. Severson on to his seven o'clock uh, event. So, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, I'm interested in hearing just a little bit about what your pension reform is, and it will. Are any of the reforms talking about affecting people that are retired or working out on their pension? Well, the answer is no. The courts have pretty much said you can't do that. And so uh, uh, some of those, the existing retirees are not affected. Uh, active uh, uh, workers, most active workers, I don't think are going to be affected by it. So it's really addressing uh, new, and it's also giving options to people who want to buy out of their current ones or those who want to voluntarily convert to a 401k type. <laughs> but for going forward, it's like we're eliminating um, uh, pensions for legislators completely, um, and uh, we are uh, making other levels of government having to uh, work more years. You know, the, uh, fortunately, the idea of working for 30 years and then retiring for 40 years, the math doesn't work. It, it's a Ponzi scheme, and the people who set the current system up should be in jail. Uh, uh, but under our government system, uh, they don't. They get rewarded, they retire, and they get to join the pension. But if you look at what happened in 1992, when they, or excuse me, in 1990, when they moved the retirement age up and they started doing compounding colas, if you looked at the map there, it was never going to work, and it was, it's been a Ponzi scheme since then. And now we're at $10 billion, one-third of all the revenue. We spend more on pensions than we do on education, on health care, uh, and it's still growing, and it's going to continue to grow the next 30 years until the 2011 reforms that we passed until those start to kick in. So it's still going to be a struggle, but at least it's going to reduce some of the increasing uh, cost of those. Thank you, Jim. One, one last thing. I, I imagine you guys have talked a lot about reducing the judges' pensions. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Yeah, that's right. It's always interesting. You talk about pension reform, and then the judges were the same pension after we won. So uh, thank you, Mr. Hoffman, Mr. Biondo. Uh, thank you, Dave. I was just wondering, uh, not having a compounding pension myself, uh, I understand that Senate President Cullerton has had written a bill that was actually going to tax retirement income in the state, which would then mean you know, we would pay thousands of dollars that we don't pay now. And actually, I would be paying more to the state than I would the federal government. So I was just wondering what, if there's any status on that Senate bill. Uh, there's no um, there's no appetite right now for tax and pensions, even though some states do. One of the advantages, I think it helps keep individuals, it helps keep seniors with money here in Illinois. If you start taxing uh, pensions with people that have dual residency, they're more likely to leave. Now, one thing we are looking at the possibility of, though, is taxing pensions for those people who retire before age 65. Because you know you get you get two people you get one person that is living in this house uh, making sixty thousand dollars a year on his pension and paying no taxes living and he's fifty eight years old living next door to another guy who's fifty eight years old that goes to work every day making the same sixty thousand but he has to pay taxes while he's working and so is it fair for that person under sixty five uh, to be having uh, to be paying no taxes uh, so we have talked about the concept of taxing pensions under sixty five. And then when you hit that retirement age, then the tax will go off. That is something that I think some people look at saying is a fairness standpoint. But there is no fair tax. The question is, what's the fairer of bad taxes? 
and uh, what can we do. But again, before we raise any taxes, one of the things we're talking about is we have to implement the reforms first. We have to stop the outmigration of jobs. Illinois is still, last year, for five years in a row, number one outmigration of jobs, especially manufacturing. That's why work comp reform is so vital, because that's the largest cost for many of these manufacturers. So we need to get that done. And if we do those things, then we've earned the right to come back and say, okay, we need more tax dollars. But I'm sure when we get done passing those increases, it'll be a temporary tax, because it'll sunset. That'll force legislators to come back and make their case of why it should be continued. So uh, we hope it'll be sunsetted as well. So uh, but the, uh, just to wrap it up, so the, the debt is something that can be, as bad as the debt is, you can amortize that and you can work through that. The fundamentals that we have in place, we're centrally located, we have the best infrastructure, we have a, a workforce that's better than most states. We have the fundamentals in Illinois to turn around pretty quickly where other states have significant problems to address we have, we have some problems, but those debt problems can be amortized. We can get through that uh, if we can just get these legislators to work. Again, we're willing to work like we're doing in the Senate to try to work in a bipartisan fashion. It makes doesn't make, doesn't help us to look back, uh, just move forward and say, how do we do this? And it's going to take both. And we hope that you understand that, and we hope you'll be there to help uh, defend us when we when we have to make the case of why we have to do more revenue. Uh, the time to do no revenue was 10 years ago, but now, because of the way it's set up, it cannot be done without it. And so we'll need your help when that time comes for those tough folks. So, but again, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come up and give an update. If I can ever be of help, let us know. If you have ideas on the reforms, please uh, email me or let us know. As every legislators, we get together and we work together well. Uh, and so uh, if you get information to us, we'll work on that and help in the area as well. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Senator Stevenson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll let you get to your seven o'clock dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item of business, we have a couple of proclamations, um, and I would ask Dr. Martell and uh, our and Board Secretary Jamie Nelson uh, from the Health Department to please come on up. tonight to in recognition of Public Health Month, whereas April has been declared National Public Health Month, and the theme for 2017 is Healthiest Nation in One Generation by 2030. And whereas the Winnebago County Health Department is the state certified local health department established by referendum for the population of Winnebago County, including the city of Rockford, and whereas the Winnebago County Health Department is working to promote, protect, prevent, and prepare the community through the three core functions and 10 essential services of public health. And whereas the community health assessment process with input from the community identified the three priorities of maternal and child health, violence, and mental behavior health. And whereas these three health priorities are interconnected and influenced by social determinants of health impacting both life expectancy and the quality of life. Whereas $1 spent on public health saves approximately $6 in health costs, according to the American Public Health Association. And now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Frank Haney, Chairman of the Winnebago County Board, do hereby proclaim April 2017 Public Health Month in Winnebago County and thank the Winnebago County Health Department public health professionals for their dedicated service and urge the community to work in partnership to address these health priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I do want to thank Dr. Martell. She is a, uh, an avid uh, county board member, uh, our county uh, board meeting uh, attendee, and I appreciate her staying informed on things before the board. Um, the next item of business, 
Uh, I would like to uh, welcome up uh, uh, Frank Manz uh, Manzullo from Keeping uh, Northern Illinois Beautiful. Mr. Manzullo. We have a proclamation in recognition of Great American Cleanup in Winnebago County. Whereas Keeping Northern Illinois Beautiful is a local nonprofit dedicated to preserving our local environment through education, community involvement, and public awareness. And whereas Winnebago County is proud of its natural resources and neighborhoods and seeks to protect and, pr and improve our community through the action of citizens, government, and businesses working together. And whereas on April 22nd, 2017, Thousands of volunteers from neighborhood groups, adopt the highway programs, and service organizations will gather to clean up our community. And I now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Frank Haney, Chairman of the Winnebago County Board, do proclaim the day, April 22nd, to be Great American Cleanup Day in Winnebago County and urge all citizens to join in cleanup projects throughout the county on April 22nd and to remember to work every day to keep our community clean, green, and healthy. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. April's a busy month. We have, we have ex uh, accepting for Money Smart Week, I believe we have uh, Keith Barnett from Prime America and Yvonne Peterson from Heritage Woods. Please come on up. Thank you for being here tonight. After all that budget talk, Money Smart Week is applicable, right? Exactly. <laughs> should send you down to Springfield. Thank you so much. We have a proclamation in recognition of Money Smart Week, April 22nd through uh, 29th, 2017. Whereas Money Smart Week began in July 2001 as a coordinated effort of the Money Smart Week Advisory Council, a diverse group of more than 40 Chicago area organizations working to promote uh, personal financial literacy. And whereas in 2007, the first Money Smart Week took place in the city of Rockford, and for seven days showcased different programs, helped consumers get information, brought together many diverse organizations and assisted organizations ensuring their expertise and resources. Whereas in times of rapidly changing technologies and developments, consumers have many choices on how to manage their financial affairs. And whereas educational and financial institutions, government entities, and community-based organizations can work together to make consumers aware of the benefits of financial literacy in order to make informed choices about their personal finances and offered programs. And now, therefore, I, Frank Haney, Chairman of the Winnebago County Board, do hereby proclaim April 22nd through 29th, 2017 as Money Smart Week. Thank you and congratulations. not see our public speaker here today so with that we will move into our next item of business may I have a motion to approve the minutes from March 9th 2016 excuse me 2017 and to lay over the minutes from March 23rd 2017 I have a motion by Mr. Jury I have a second by Mr. Hoffman Mrs. Crosby Mr. Nicolosi and Mr. Fiducia any comments questions on the minutes before us Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Minutes approved. Thank you. Announcements and communications. Clerk Mullins. The items listed below were received as correspondence. Okay, we will be placing those on file. Thank you, Clerk Mullins. Uh, 
Uh, moving on to our regular agenda here, um, any board member correspondence I have Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I have two. Uh, the Winnebago County Veterans Association announces scholarship, two $1,000 scholarships and two $500 scholarships. Opportunity will be available, one each for a female and a male senior graduating from Winnebago County program, program this year. Scholarship application may be obtained from local veteran service clubs or by email request. And that's srpet6871 at gmail.com. And the deadline is next Friday the 21st. The second piece of information I have here is at Veterans Memorial Hall <coughs> lunch and lecture series, understanding the first world war a century later, put on by Terry Dyer. The first of these events will take place Next Wednesday, April 19th, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., part one, some damn, damn mishap in the Balkans, why the world went to war. The next one will be Wednesday, May 17th, 11 to 1, part two, a quick and easy little war. It will be over by Christmas. And the last one is Wednesday, June 21st, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Part 3. Here come the Yanks. America enters the war. The cost is $12 and lunch is part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And if you could do me a huge favor, sir, and get that information to Julia. Or we have that. And then we'll get that out to the group if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Any other board member comments? Okay, I'm going to go through the chairman's report as quickly as possible. I know we want to get to the business uh, part of the agenda here. Um, county mission vision value discussion. One of the things I've heard from some board members and from some elected officials is that the need for the fiscal year 18 budget process and to have the board involved in an appropriate way in budget discussions in a holistic way and also the elected officials and department heads want to have input in the process naturally as well. Um, what I'm hearing from some folks on both groups is the need to start that conversation, kick off that conversation, um, with some discussion of this organization's mission, vision, and values. And, and I could just quickly say, um, myself and our, um, some of our administration leadership took a tour to McHenry County, met with their chairman and their administration leadership, and that's exactly what they've done in the past. Um, and that's something we're gonna talk a little bit more in the coming weeks, just to, to kick around here. Uh, the next item, uh, legislative strategy, um, so if quarterly we have our state delegation, a member of our state delegation come in and chat with us, um, I think that's a good step of just staying up to date. We need to stay in touch with them as well. I thank Mr. Webster for the good idea on this. Um, part two, we're going to discuss in the next couple weeks, um, we may be recommending that we engage a lobbyist as well. There is so much going on, um, and when talking to the state delegation, talking to members of, some members of the board, um, and folks that are active in Springfield, sometimes it's what you help stop. Sometimes it's about positioning relationship-wise for future funding discussions. Could be infrastructure, could be a number of other things. We may want to re-engage. We used to do that as a county. Uh, I feel like we're not being, that, that missing piece is hurting us right now. And uh, we need to cut, make sure that is working uh, uh, as well as our relationships with our state delegation. Um, Act initiative update, one of the things with, uh, with some of the budget challenges we're having um, is making sure we're accountable to the community with the dollars we are spending. That means we need to communicate that. And I know there's a lot of needs, uh, there's a deficit we're dealing with, but we also are dealing with millions of dollars of other people's money. One of the things we're going to be talking about internally is how are we communicating how we're spending the dollars that are in play in this budget now. What are the outcomes of that? What are the outcomes of the dollars coming from our host fee uh, investments? Um, and uh, so those are going to be discussions coming, and I think they're going to be very healthy ones. The 1% public safety tax, just a quick reminder. I don't want it to go unsaid. Um, the budget for this year, fiscal year 17, was projected to have a $1.9 million deficit. Now that Carla and our staff is, is more entrenched in the process, 
and looking at sales tax revenue coming in, we are projecting that unless there's a change in revenue coming in, we will have a $2.5 million deficit in the 1% public safety tax fund. Um, that would leave us, if that would play out as we're projecting, that would leave us with approximately $11.5 million uh, of reserve balance. Um, and so those will be discussions as we go through the budget process. Obviously, we cannot sustain that if the revenues are gonna stay constant or continue to slide down a little bit. Um, the uh, Moving on, uh, on your sheet or on your table, you should see a, a press release from the YWCA. Uh, this does involve a community discussion that will involve our sheriff, the sheriff's department, and a discussion uh, that is not before the board for action tonight, but this is an informational piece um, Sheriff Caruana is having some preliminary informational discussions about the possibility of uh, housing uh, ICE detainees. Um, that is a discussion that is early on, and uh, the YWCA is hosting a community forum to kind of have a question and answer session, uh, and that would be this Monday evening. Uh, in a couple of weeks, after the sheriff has a little more time to do due diligence, um, we might have him back here for an update on that discussion. Um, it is my understanding, talking to the state's attorney's office, Mr. Kerlinkus, that that would be a board level decision if we would go forward uh, and there would be a formal recommendation that would come before the board and we'd make sure you have all the information there. Um, last couple items, uh, state of the county, you have a brochure here if you are interested in attending on May 4th over the lunch hour, um, please email, I believe, Julia or Amy in the office, make sure we get you at a table and we'd love to have you join us, of course. Uh, lastly is the Keeping Northern Illinois Beautiful. I believe you have a little flyer on your table for April 22nd. So um, with that, I'll conclude my report uh, unless there's any questions. Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I got a motion by Mr. Jury and I have a second by Mr. Hoffman. Any discussion on the consent agenda before you? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes on the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, next item of business, uh, we have our finance committee update. Uh, Mr. Biondo. budget amendment 2017-017 it's a circuit court a child sex trafficking a training event it's an eight thousand dollar grant it's financially neutral it was unanimously approved by our committee i just want to read it in first okay thank you all right and then i'd like to uh, make a motion to suspend the rules to approve i got a motion by mr biondo to suspend the rules and a second by mr mcdonald wilson um, and uh, Mrs. Red, uh, any questions on the motion before us just to suspend the rules so that we can vote on this this evening? Seeing none, all those in favor of suspending the rules signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion to suspend that the rules passes. Mr. Beyond. Thank you. I'd like to then make a motion to approve Budget Amendment 2017-017. I have a motion by Mr. Biondo, a second by Mr. McDonald, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, any questions by board members on the motion on the uh, motion before us? The motion to approve. Seeing none, is there any objection uh, to the motion to approve this budget amendment? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to cast a yes vote for all members present. Mr. Biondo. Yes, I'd like to now move to approve the resolution authorizing settlement of a claim against the county of Winnebago entitled uh, Mark Jurassic versus Winnebago County. Uh, it was uh, unanimously approved by the Finance Committees for $117,500 for workman's compensation uh, on the job, and uh, I move for its approval. We have a motion by Mr. Biondo on the resolution, a uh, second by Mr. Webster. Oh, Mr. Okay, so we will just read that in this evening then. I, I stand corrected. 
that was added to the agenda, and then so it's being read in, and we would take that matter up in two weeks. Thank you, Mr. Schultz and Mr. Jury, for pointing that out. Mr. Biondo. That goes on. Thank you, Mr. Biondo. Next item of business, Zoning Committee, Mr. Webster. Thank you, Zoning Committee has no report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Webster. Next item of business, Economic Development Committee, Mr. Westcott, making a return trip finally to the podium. Good to have you back, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. We have two items before you tonight. The resolution granting authority to the Winnebago County Board Chairman to execute the documents necessary to complete a loan for $20,000 from the revolving loan fund to the Lucretia's Taste of Soul, Inc., and I so move. We have a motion by Mr. Westcott. I have a second by Mrs. Crosby and Mr. Wilson and Mr. Hoffman on, on this resolution B. Uh, and Mrs. Red, I stand corrected. Thank you. Uh, any questions by board members on the motion before us? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes. We have uh, Mr. Schultz on a no vote. With that, motion passes. Mr. Westcott. Thank you, Chairman. We have a resolution authorizing the Chairman of the County Board to execute a redevelopment agreement with FedEx Ground Package Systems, Inc. And I so move. We have a motion by Mr. Westcott, a second by Mr. Girl, Mrs. Red, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Biondo, Mr. Hoffman. Um, any discussion by board members? With that, I may turn to Mr. Dornbush for about a, just a one minute overview of this, just so we're all on the same page of what this is. Thanks, Chair. Uh, this is a uh, FedEx game off of Baxter Road years back it was part of an incentive that was agreed upon back in the day this is just memorializing the agreement uh, what was agreed upon was 50% tax refund uh, the taxing bodies will still collect uh, approximately uh, 1.77 million dollars over the next 15 years off the FedEx development that's coming through thank you mr. Dornbush any questions by board members yes mr. Biondo we also 50-50. Yes. It is a 50-50 split. Thank you, Mr. Biondo and Mr. Dornbush. Uh, any other questions by board members? Seeing none, all those in favor uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Westcott. Thank you, Chairman. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Westcott. Next item of business, uh, we have our Operations Administrative Committee, Mr. Jury. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Haney. Um, I would like to make a motion uh, because we discussed all these in a joint caucus that we take all of these items or six agendas or six items on my agenda all at once, and I make a motion to uh, to do that. So we have a motion by Mr. Jury to take on items B, C, D, E, F, and G. Uh, I have a second by Mrs. Crosby, Mr. Fellers, Mrs. Gorl, Mrs. Red, Mr. Nicolosi, Mr. Boomer. We're okay with this one. Um, with that said, uh, any questions by board members on the motion uh, to approve B through G on Mr. Jury's committee? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion to approve B through G passes. Mr. Jury. No, I can make a motion to uh, approve uh, all the agendas on my agenda. Okay. We have a motion to approve uh, B through G uh, Mr. Uh, by Mr. Jury, a second by Mr. Westcott and Mrs. Gorl and Mrs. Red. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Jury. Thank you, that concludes our report. Thank you. Next item of business, Public Works Committee, Mr. Kelly. Public Works Committee has five items before you this evening. The first 
a resolution awarding a bid for county highway vehicles uh, totaling uh, $394,986, $337,586 of which is installment financing, and I'll move its adoption. We have a motion by Mr. Kelly, I have a second by Mr. Boomer and Mr. Webster. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, all those in, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. Mr. Kelly. Next, we have an award of bid for work at Riverside Boulevard and Forest Hills Road partial depth pavement joint repair for a cost to awarded to Rock Road Companies at the cost of $244, $286, and 50 cents. And I move its adoption. We have a motion by Mr. Kelly and item C. May I have a second? Mr. Bo uh, Mr. Boomer, Mr. Webster, Mr. Viando, and Mrs. Crosby. Do I have any questions, comments by board members? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is approved. Mr. Kelly. Next, we have a resolution authorizing the obligation retirement of bond payments from motor fuel tax funds and all of its adoption. We have a motion on letter D on the MFT funds uh, by Mr. Kelly. I have a second by Mr. Jury and Mr. Westcott. Any questions by board members on the item before you? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The motion passes, Mr. Kelly. Next, we have an ordinance amending chapter 82 of the Winnebago County Code designating Lindenwood Road, that's County Highway 72, as a Class 2 truck route. And I'm reading it in. We'll read that in this evening. Uh, we'll be reading that in, so thank you, Mr. Kelly. And I'd like to move to suspend the rules. We have a motion to suspend the rules for letter E by Mr. Kelly. I have a second uh, by Mr. Boomer. Any questions on the motion to lay over, I'm sorry, to suspend the rules? A motion to suspend the rules. Seeing none, all those in favor of suspending the rules signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion to suspend passes, Mr. Kelly. Aye. And I will now move uh, adoption of the ordinance. We, we have a motion to approve letter E, a second by Mr. Boomer and Mr. Jury. Any questions by board members? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Kelly. And finally, we have a resolution authorizing the ex and execution of an agreement with the State of Illinois Department of Transportation for Economic Development Program and Truck Access Route Program funding for improvements to County Highway 72 Lindenwood Road, south of Baxter Road, and County Highway 11 Baxter Road at Lindenwood Road, authorizing the execution of an agreement with Rock River Environmental Services for the improvement of Baxter Road at Lindenwood Road and Lindenwood Road to the south of Baxter Road. And I will move its adoption. We have a motion by Mr. Kelly, second by Mr. Boomer, Mr. Webster, Mrs. and Mr. Goral. Uh, any questions on item uh, F? Uh, Mr. Jury. Thank you, Chairman Haney. I just want to make a statement. I think this is it's using our money smartly, wisely. Uh, this is true economic development. This is the golden goose. Thank you. This is the true economic development. It, it does that, and it relieves the taxpayer of a burden that they don't have to do. Uh, whoever thought of that idea, I commend you. Thank you, and I think it will really improve our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. The only thing I would add on the host fee part that was part of the fiscal year 17 budget, so that was baked in and approved by the prior board into the fiscal year 17 budget cycle. Any other questions by board members on item F, uh, the resolution before us? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes, Mr. Kelly. That concludes our report. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Next item of business. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Webster, I apologize. Help us out, oh, Mr. Oh, Webster. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
forgotten announcement. Uh, the county highway department's going to have its open house week uh, from May 5th to May 5th and May 6th, uh, beginning with an open house cookout on the 4th of May. And you're all invited. Well, thank you, Mr. Kelly, and we'll make sure we get that information out to you via email, and uh, we'll remind you, the, remind you at the next board meeting as well. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Fiducia, Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No report. With that, do we have any unfinished business? Uh, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just in response to the presentation from uh, the leadership of our public safety in the community, I would just appeal that we look into grant potential grant funding for such a large expenditure, uh, both at the federal and the state level. I don't know what might be available, but uh, based on the, the need that was presented, the potential efficiencies of using technology, but also the budgetary problems that we have, it seems like at least exploring that as an option would be necessary and helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Uh, Mr. Fiducia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to respond to that uh, quickly. I don't think they brought this up and uh, it's going to be available at probably other meetings, but I do know that uh, they are exploring uh, state, federal uh, grants. They're also looking at uh, private uh, private uh, entities uh, investing money into the system too, such as uh, Swedish American and Mercy uh, Hospitals. Uh, they're looking at uh, private businesses too. So I uh, just want to assure you all that uh, every avenue is being looked at on that. Um, and I, once again, I'm going to urge anybody that can possibly make that trip on the 19th uh, to do it because I'm really quite interested. And I think if you look at that, Chicago Fusion Center, you're going to see something really cool, too. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fiducia. Appreciate that. Any new business by board members? Um, before we adjourn, um, we do have three. We have one, two, three, four appointments. Uh, one to the Harlem Roscoe Fire Protection District, uh, the New Milford Fire Protection District, North Park Water, and uh, the Reclamation District that will be read in this evening, and then we'll take that up. Um, given that the um, a couple of these items, uh, the one in particular, uh, the Reclamation District is a paid board, I, I would encourage the board not to lay this one over and just let it be out there for a couple weeks and then we'll take it up in two weeks just so it's a matter of public record if that's okay. Uh, ultimately, it's a board decision. Uh, with that, uh, Mrs. Corwin. It's a board, if the board wants to suspend the rules and push through all four, that's fine. Uh, we've read them in, so we have a motion to suspend the rules. Uh, before us, a second by Mr. Westcott, Mr. Girl. Yeah. Can I uh, make a friendly amendment to suspend all four? That was a here. The motion was to, uh, the motion was to uh, take all four on. Oh. We have a second. Do we have any questions on all four before us? Yes, Mrs. Ray. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question on the fourth one. Yes. It's a paid position. How much is that paid? Can you tell us? I should know this, but it might be six or seven thousand. And I apologize, I don't have that exact number. Four fifty one, that Okay. Tim Hans is the executive director of that board. And there will be another appointment coming um, in a, within a month on that board as well. Yes, ma'am. How long has this person been on this board? I do not know that. I know that Mr. Pollock is a former board member of the county board, um, and we evaluated his um, his performance talk. I met with him personally. I am very comfortable with him remaining on this board. Uh, his background at Utah's um, and his due diligence on that board uh, and his reputation, um, I'm very comfortable with him going forward. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the questions. Mr. Jury. Excuse me. Uh, Rick's been on that board, I believe, about six years now. Okay. Six years. Rick is an outstanding individual for that board with his background. He has an engineering degree. He's well qualified for that. And he's done one hell of a job since he's been there. Thank you. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed with Mr. Uh, uh, Hansen, who's the new executive director. He's put together a great team there, and uh, we want a good board around him. Uh, there was one, was there a question over here? Uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to add to what has been said about Rick. I know him personally. We used to sit side by side on the county board. We talked. He is a good man. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Uh, any questions? We have all four. Oh, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just think it's necessary for this board to note and recognize that we are contemplating and put in front of us a policy change where we would not have county board members serving in paid positions. And this would be, um, we would not affirm this. Two years, two years. We would not affirm this for someone that is within two years of serving on the county. He hasn't been there. Oh, one at a time, please. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this is a violation of that to be determined policy, but I do think it's necessary to recognize that we would perform differently if we had adopted that policy on those issues. That's all I'm saying. And I have feedback. Thank you, Mr. Schultz, first of all, for bringing that up. It's true, Mr. Pollock has served on the board here at the county in the past. Um, what I would say is, in talking with the state's attorney um, on this several times, they advised that it would be for current board members. Um, and so with his performance being exemplary and with the distance of time, I felt very comfortable, but it is a very fair thing to point out. Uh, Mr. Tassoni. I was just gonna say that I'm happy we didn't adopt those policies pertaining to board members being appointed to other boards. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you, Chairman. I, uh, I agree in principle with Mr. Schultz. I think we're being somewhat, somewhat hypocritical in what we're doing here. Uh, I, I think Mr. Sweeney was a fine choice, too. And in fact, I think picking people from this board is a wise decision as we, the time you serve on the board is like a four year interview. So I didn't like the discussion we had before when we talked about we had 50 million people or so to pick from, but we just left the board out. I, I thought that was wrong then. I think it's wrong now. So I, I agree. Rick Pollock is a very good uh, guy. He's good on the board. He's good on this. That's why I disagree with the whole principle from the start. I'm, I'm uh, overlooking county board members. Thanks. The, and just to clarify, thank you, Mr. Hoffman. The, the policy that was adopted a couple of weeks ago states very clearly that it is uh, we cannot appoint board members county board members or members of our families, I believe, uh, to paid boards. Um, that would include the Reclamation District. The advice of the state's attorney, um, former board members um, would not fall under that policy, again, at the advice of legal counsel. Uh, but I appreciate the comments, and I'm actually glad we're having the discussion. I think it's healthy just to put it out there. So appreciate it. Um, any other questions on uh, the four appointments that are before us before Oh, Mrs. Crosby. Um, just a question. You wanted to hold his name off. Is that for procedural purposes? Or why? If there's the will of the board to move that forward and there's a confidence level, I'm good with it. Ultimately, that's a board decision, so I respect that. I feel confident with the recommendation. So we have the we have a, a motion to suspend the rules uh, is before us on all four of our candidates, and we had a second to suspend the rules. Uh, all those in favor of suspending the rules signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion to suspend the rules is passed. Uh, I would, with that, uh, entertain a motion to approve all four of the candidates for their various positions. I have Mr. Girl on, a mo on the motion, Mr. Wilson on a second, along with Mr. Jury, Biondo, and Mr. Westcott. Any discussion on the four items before us for board appointments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. I take a uh, motion to adjourn. Mr. Jury, second by Mr. Wilson. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion to adjourn passes. Have a great